Tiffany Valentine was likely born sometime in the late 1950s in New Jersey, based on this line. We're from Jersey. Implying that both of them are. Tiffany is the older of two girls born in her family. Growing up, she was close to her mother, who had a lot of sayings about relationships that stuck with her over the years, such as, love is supposed to set you free, if a woman spends all day slaving over a hot stove for a man, the least he can do is the dishes, you can always smell it on girls who sell it, you can't put a price on love, never let a man block you from what really makes you happy, if you love somebody, set them free, and perhaps the one that would be the most relevant to her, once is a blessing, twice is a curse. Well, that won't explain your sister. Other than these quotes, Tiffany's childhood is surprisingly mostly never mentioned, leaving the cause of her sadistic, homicidal behavior up to speculation. When you put all of her mother's quotes together, you realize that they're all kind of salty takes about relationships. It makes me wonder if Tiffany's mother left her father and attempted to raise the girls alone. The Mrs. Valentinisms come up situationally throughout the franchise, but let's try putting them in the correct order and building Tiffany's story. Once is a blessing, twice is a curse. Tiffany's parents started off well, but things declined when her younger sister was born because caring for a second child was more stressful. The least he can do is the dishes. Tiffany's mom becomes fed up when her father is not pulling his weight in household chores. You can always smell it on girls who sell it, and you can't put a price on love. Sounds like as their relationship deteriorated, Mr. Valentine turned to a prostitute. Never let a man block you from what really makes you happy, and if you love somebody, set them free. Finally, she snaps and gets divorced from Tiffany's father. My guess is that it was quite a dramatic falling out, which will help explain almost all of Tiffany's puzzling behavior later on. As far as we can tell, she's never had any platonic friends. She's hanging out alone at a nightclub in 1984, sipping a martini, when she's first approached by a man who calls her Red. He's referring to her red hair. It's not clear if this is her natural hair color, but Red is her favorite color. Is there something I can do for you? Yeah, maybe there is. They all end up at the Hotel Hackensack, where Tiffany and the blonde get busy while the man watches. She demonstrates her aggressive behavior by ripping off the woman's necklace. While she is distracted, the man yanks her off the bed and gestures a knife in her direction. Instead of cowering away, she just smiles and eggs him on. Do it. Do it to me. Now. Her aggressiveness with the woman and masochism with the man is enough to make me think that Tiffany had already discovered her bloodlust prior to meeting this couple, and she was probably at that nightclub looking for prey. She was wearing a leopard pattern after all. She's identifying herself as a predator. The man locks eyes with her for a minute, and the blonde gets jealous. In an unexpected move, he stabs the blonde instead of the redhead, and invites Tiffany to play in the carnage with him. She proceeds to stab the woman seven more times as she breaks down into cries of joy and laughter. Wow. It's never happened like that before. She doesn't specify exactly what she's talking about here, but it does further my suspicion that this isn't the first chapter of her crime career. The two passionately make love beside the mess they just created. She introduces herself, and when she learns his name, Charles, she's the one to suggest that he go by Chucky. He gives her a suggestion as well, to go blonde. These suggestions each become iconic elements of their respective characters. And so began one of the worst, most toxic romances I've ever f***ing seen. To learn how Tiffany's childhood shaped her into a monster, the secrets behind her survival, the disturbing truth about her motherhood, and how her career as a professional poker player helps her carry out an evil plot in the future, stick around to the end of this video. Welcome to Horror History. There are not many characters who have the power to revitalize a franchise so many years in. After Child's Play 3 in 1991, producers Don Mancini and David Kirshner were inspired to create a fresh take for Chucky after seeing the way that Scream reinvigorated the horror genre with satire, something they talked about on the movie's official website back in the days when movie websites didn't suck. The fourth Chucky film became more of a romantic comedy by introducing a love interest for the supernaturally possessed doll. Enter Tiffany Valentine, or she would become known Tiffany Ray. Tiffany is a name of Greek origin, meaning manifestation of God. She would be the second character ever to be aided by the power of the voodoo god Dembella. Valentine refers to the holiday of love and romance, Valentine's Day. Tiffany's entire character has been influenced by her mom's distorted teachings about love. Although the fanbase is split on the comedic approach to Chucky, which I refer to as the Bride Seed arc, most would agree that Tiffany has become a fan favorite character, who stuck around even after the movie swung back to a horror first approach. From an emotional standpoint, there's a lot going on with this character, so let's take it back to her mid 20s to understand how she got so messed up. Tiffany is referred to as a body disposal expert. It's clear that she has no sense of morality, but her skill when it comes to cleaning up after herself at least keeps her from facing any murder charges in her 20s. That being said, her disregard for other laws still got her in trouble, often landing her with jail time and a mugshot in the newspaper. 
I always dreamed of having a big church wedding with bridesmaids and a cake and my picture in the paper. Not just the usual mugshot, but something really flattering. At some point, authorities distinguished her from being a common criminal and determined that mental illness was a factor. Is mommy ill? The courts thought so. She's somehow able to stay out of an institution. I would conclude that her life of crime linked to mental illness was a direct result of her upbringing. Her mother's philosophies make it clear that there was a lot of friction between Tiffany's parents. This medically reviewed article by clinical social worker Amy Marin describes the mental effects that fighting parents can have on a child. A lot of these describe Tiffany's behavior, but for now, let's just look at behavior problems. Parental conflict has been linked to increased aggression, delinquency, and conduct problems in children. As these kids develop into adults, behavior problems in school become run-ins with the law, inability to fit in with society, and mugshots in the paper. Shortly after she hooked up with Chucky, Chucky actually killed Tiffany's mother, the woman that Tiff is constantly quoting. Yet, she stays with Chucky after this, and even wants to spend more time with him. I always wanted us to spend more time together, maybe do some traveling and see the world. This suggests that in her adulthood, she didn't have a good relationship with her mother, which could likely be a lingering effect of parental fighting. It can affect the parent-child relationship. The quality of the relationship may be affected as it may be difficult for parents to show warmth and affection when they're angry and upset with the other parents. I can basically go on and on about how parental quarrels may have impacted her. For example, it can cause insecurity. Tiffany gets a tattoo on her chest, a heart with a dagger, and her boyfriend's name. This study in the National Library of Medicine found that young women with tattoos reported significantly lower self-esteem. I'm not saying all tattoos bad, I have a tattoo, but the difference is mine is perfect, and I had a long time to think about it. Tiffany's is a tacky emotional crutch that she got to impress a man that doesn't actually care about her. Tiffany also becomes a big fan of Martha Stewart. The article states that women who watch Martha Stewart have significantly... I'm kidding. After a few years of dating and committing crimes together in Hackensack, it was time for these two fish to move to a bigger pond. Or should I say, lake. But first, there was one order of business to take care of. Before leaving New Jersey, Chucky and Tiffany need a vehicle, and the two look at this 1960 Pontiac Parisian. Tiffany loves the color, Coronado Red, because it's her favorite color, and it can easily hide spatters of blood. When the seller discloses that the previous owners were decapitated in the car, she gets a huge smile. She gleefully slashes the seller's throat with her nail file and climbs into the driver's seat. She also takes a little taste of his blood. Along with weaponizing her nail file, this is something that becomes a signature of hers. As they set off, she notices Chucky reading something about voodoo, something that would become a very big part of her life later on. They arrive in Chicago, Illinois in 1988 and get their first apartment together. She's immediately blown away by it and begins interior designing in her head. Martha Stewart has been rubbing off on her. Charles suggests they order a pizza and she loves the idea because she knows exactly what that means. Not only are they ordering a pizza, but they're also ordering a pizza delivery man and new victims are just as satiating as deep dish for these two. They share a cigarette afterwards as they debate the merits of Chicago versus Jersey style pizza. The scene also contains more potential evidence that disaccord from her youth is still affecting her. Another telltale sign is substance abuse, something that becomes much more likely in a high conflict family. But at least at this point, the young couple is getting along. Like substance abuse, violence seems to be something that can numb over any relationship issues. I think a lot of people have had that ex that just isn't really compatible with you, but when you're in bed, everything is good. For these two, it's offing people. And like that ex, there's a limited amount of times you can turn to this distraction before the relationship issues are impossible to ignore. As they stop hunting together as frequently, tension rises in the relationship. At the time of the original movie, Chucky has his own place, so my theory is that they broke up, causing him to move out, but they got back together, and Chucky just kept his other apartments to use for other purposes. Besides, he's definitely not getting his deposit back, seeing as what he's done with the place. Chucky starts seeing another woman at this point, however, it's not clear if Tiffany knew about this. I don't think she did, but I'll get back to that later. On November 8th, 1988, Tiffany comes home from the grocery store with ingredients to make Chucky's favorite food, Swedish meatballs, and catches him in the other room, finishing some lady with a knife. That's not an innuendo, I mean literally. But to her, stabbing Solo is just as bad as cheating. She's jealous that he's getting his fix without her. A new form of JGS that we've never explored before. She confronts him on their lack of murder dates as of late, and he just blows off the argument. It's obvious that this isn't the first time that they've separated without being able to talk out the problem. 
It's a symptom of one of the biggest effects of parental infighting, relationship issues. It's pretty obvious how this goes. As a kid, your brain is still developing and adapting to your environment. When kids see their parents fighting all the time, they learn that that's how you solve disputes, and they end up using the same tactics in their own personal relationships, which means toxic relationships. Instead of trying to fix the issue, she tries to get back at her boyfriend. She calls the police station and asks for Detective Mike Norris, the lead detective on the Lakeshore Strangler case, and fills him in on Charles' whereabouts. This leads to the police finding where he's kidnapped his mistress, chasing him through Chicago, and ultimately killing him inside of a toy store. After his death, Tiffany finds a ring on the mantle and believes that Chucky had been planning to propose to her. Tiffany does know that Charles had been experimenting with voodoo and keeps hope alive that he might have been able to transfer his soul out of his body before dying, so she continues to wear the ring every day. She searched for 10 years. There are rumors and urban legends of a possessed good guy doll that first appeared right after Charles' death in 1988, then again in 1990, but the alleged activity always dissipates before Tiffany can get there. She's forced to move to a mobile home in Lockport, New York. I'm guessing she moved there in 1998 or 1999 because at the time of Bride of Chucky in spring 1999, it sounds like she hasn't been there for very long. So you're moving out already? She keeps the ring and the car, but nothing else. Her belief in Chucky's return is so strong that she fantasizes about having a baby with him when he comes back and builds a slide-out playpen in her trailer. The place is decorated all over with baby dolls. It's possible that she just has an obsession with dolls because of the legends about her boyfriend becoming a doll, but based on her past, I have a different theory. I talked about the emotional damage she received from her parents fighting with each other, but perhaps the stressful home environment also led to one of the parents abusing her. These victims tend to have their emotional development stunted. In other words, the trauma may freeze their brain's development, making them unable to grow up in certain ways. This could explain the baby dolls, the little girl voice associated with many of these types of victims. Oh! childlike tantrums, and many other symptoms, some of which overlap with the psychological damage caused by fighting between parents. I'm not gonna dwell on this too much, because there's no evidence that she was abused, it's possible that she just likes dolls, but I wouldn't be surprised if we end up learning that her parents were a little heavy-handed with her. It seems like she's about to move on from Chucky by 1999. She starts dating a cringy goth dude named Damien, but doesn't put out for him, because in her words, I'll kill anybody, but I'll only sleep with someone I love. And she doesn't love him because he's not a real killer like Chucky. In 1999, she hears about another potential Chucky appearance at a military academy in Missouri. The remains of the good guy doll end up in an evidence locker nearby, so she bribes a cop named Robert Bailey to retrieve them for her, only to slit his throat with her nail file and collect the spoils. She goes home to sew the doll back together and attempts to bring it back to life with the help of her Voodoo for Dummies book. It doesn't appear to work at first. However, Damien comes over and she soon notices that the doll has moved. She gets the idea to chain Damien to the bed and strip tease for both him and the doll. Anybody even looked at me, Chucky would take care of him, wouldn't you, Chucky? This is her cue. Chucky turns his head to lock eyes with Damien, and Tiffany looks on as her ex rips out her new boyfriend's piercing and smothers him with a pillow. Bringing someone to an early grave is what started Tiffany and Chucky's relationship, and it also provides a spark for them to rekindle that relationship here. The couple are glad to see each other for a couple of minutes before they go back to being toxic as f it's part of a long cycle, which we see more examples of. It doesn't take long for the friction between them to start up again when Chucky makes an off-putting comment. I always thought you were gonna let yourself go. Nonetheless, she prepares him his favorite meal, Swedish meatballs, and explains how she never stopped wearing his ring. She is dismayed to find out that Charles had stolen the ring in order to sell it, not to propose to her. When he hysterically laughs in her face, she realizes that he hasn't changed, and probably never will. She locks him in her makeshift playpen and tells him she prefers him in this baby-like form. I think what she really likes is having control over him, since his independent behavior is what caused issues for them in the past. The bedroom is one thing, but hopefully I don't have to explain why it's not a good idea to get involved with a woman who is a control freak in all aspects of life. This is another aspect of her character that stays with her through the years. That night, she removes her ring for the first time and weeps in her bed next to Damien's lifeless body. The next day, she would look for love elsewhere, but her search and her life would be cut short. The next day, Tiffany gets her neighbor, Jesse Miller, to help her load the trunk containing Damien's body into the car. She asks Jesse out on a date that evening, but Jesse has a girlfriend, so Tiffany tells him to treat her right and heads off to dump Damien in the East River, which according to Buffalo native and fellow YouTube creator Bryce Edward Brown is the prime location to dump bodies in New York. I'm not sure why he knows that. On the way back, she buys a female doll about Chucky's size and puts it into the playpen with him to be his new partner to taunt him. That evening, she takes a bath and giggles as she watches the news report on her most recent string of victims 
victims before switching to Bride of Frankenstein, which she seems moved by, perhaps because of the monster's unconditional interest in the bride upon their meeting. While Tiffany is distracted, Chucky escapes his cage and pushes her TV into the bath, causing her to be electrocuted to death. This is where most people do that joke that the video is over, but I'm kind of sick of that meme, so let's just skip to the part where Chucky transfers her soul into the female doll, and she wakes up, realizes what happens, and is horrified. With both of them in doll form, Chucky wants to marry her so she can love, serve, and obey him. Hopefully I don't have to explain why it's not a good idea to get involved with someone who has those intentions. Tiffany is more interested in transferring back into a human body, but Chuck explains that to do that, they need an amulet called the Heart of Dembella, which was buried with Chucky's corpse in Hackensack, New Jersey. They come up with a plan to get Jesse to drive them to the cemetery for $1,000, under the ruse that Tiffany can't deliver the dolls because she's taking care of a friend who's mentally incapacitated. Before leaving, she gives herself a makeover to look more like her human self, which I don't get because she's planning to go back to a human form in just a couple days. Women. Next, there's a scene that isn't shown in any movie, but it's kind of important to talk about. Chucky and Tiffany hide Tiffany's discarded human body somewhere so that Jesse doesn't come into the trailer and discover it rotting there. This works to their advantage much later on, but we'll get to that. After finding Tiffany's note, Jesse makes an unexpected stop to pick up his girlfriend Jade with plans to run away and get married, which Tiffany finds romantic, but Chucky finds sickening. Oh, that's so romantic. I give him six months. Three if she gains weight. They watch as Jade's uncle, the Lockport police chief Warren Kincaid, tries to plant drugs in Jesse's van. So Tiffany creates a trap using nails in an airbag designed to kill Warren when he goes to investigate her giggling in the front seat. They hide the chief under the back seat before Jesse and Jade get back. They must have been able to hoist him up there due to the super strength afforded by Dumbella. When Jesse and Jade come back, they stay in a Barbie mode around humans to try to get to their destination without raising suspicion. The van immediately gets pulled over by another cop, the chief's lackey, Officer Norton. As he searches the vehicle, well, Tiffany kicks him in the head to prevent him from finding Warren's body, but as a result, he does find the drugs that were planted there. Wanting to keep their journey on track and their chauffeur out of prison, Chucky borrows Tiff's lighter and she watches with delight as he uses it to ignite Officer Norton's gas tank. Jesse speeds away from the scene, which Tiffany refers to as Chucky, still knowing how to show a girl a good time. Once again, all logic about the compatibility of their relationship goes out the window for her when she sees Chucky do what he does best. The two dolls giggle as Jesse and Jade bicker about what just actually happened. They stop at a small chapel in Niagara Falls to tie the knot, and Tiffany shares her longtime dream of getting married, which actually causes Chucky to stop and actually give her a real apology. I guess being back on the run from the law with her reminded him of their younger days and struck a chord with him. Every time blood spills, they seem to get a little bit closer. To add to the romance, Warren, who is somehow still alive, pops up in the back of the van and Chucky stabs him in the back to finish the job. That night, they all stay in the Honeymoon Suites Motel in Niagara, where another couple barges into Jesse and Jade's room and Tiffany notices the woman steal Jesse's wallet. Obviously, this woman doesn't know that dolls are alive, so Tiffany ends up being the only one to see this happen, and it enrages her. I'm guessing Tiffany is not suddenly taking some kind of moral high ground and that this is more about trying to ensure that their journey is not interrupted again. She sneaks into their room and hurls their champagne bottle at the mirror on the ceiling, causing it to shatter and slice them apart on the way down. The first example of Tiffany's very impressive throwing arm. Chucky is absolutely smitten after seeing this. I love you. He steals the ring finger of the newly deceased newlywed and uses it to propose to Tiffany for real this time, and she's brought to tears. From this point, she goes by Tiffany Ray. After realizing she has one human bodily function, her tears, the two decide to test another. Chucky believes that he doesn't need to use a rubber because he's all rubber, despite actually being made of plastic, so the two brush it off and continue their intimate moment. This moment would have dire consequences. Tiffany becomes pregnant, and because the two dolls are being kept alive by the power of voodoo, this is a voodoo pregnancy, which means everything is accelerated and it only takes a couple of days until delivery. Despite that, they don't realize that they've just conceived a child. Later that night, they come up with a plan to transfer their souls into Jesse and Jade's bodies once they've reacquired the amulet. The next morning, they have to make a quick exit when the maid discovers the bodies of the other honeymooning couple, and Jesse and Jade are surprised by the appearance of their friend David, who shows up to help with the newfound relationship issues being caused by the murderous dolls that they're towing. When David accidentally finds Warren's decomposing remains in the back, he grabs the chief's gun and demands that they pull over, just as a passing cop recognizes Jesse's van and approaches. The change in circumstances forces Chucky and Tiffany to make themselves known by pulling out guns of their own, which I have no idea how they obtained, and take the three humans hostage. This frightens David so much that he backs himself into oncoming traffic, so Tiffany gives Jesse the order to get this heap of sh moving. 
after getting away, they steal an RV from an older couple by shooting them in the head so that they won't be recognized on the road. Tiffany ties up Jade and gives her a makeover, presumably preparing for the moment that she moves in to Jade's body. She also makes some meatballs and cookies in the oven for her new husband, but quickly becomes enraged when Chucky makes a comment about the dishes not being cleaned. Jade and Jesse make a couple strategic remarks to kind of turn Tiffany and Chucky against each other. Jade edges Tiffany to retaliate after feeling underappreciated, and this starts a huge fight, which includes dish throwing, bickering, and insulting Chucky's manhood. Take it from me, honey. Plastic is no substitute for a nice hunk of wood. Jade uses the distraction to kick Tiffany into the oven, and the RV crashes in the ensuing chaos, conveniently right into the cemetery where they need to go. Tiffany's skin bakes inside the oven, increasing her rage even further. She busts out and attacks Jade, biting her in the ear before Jesse grabs her and throws her out the window. She's unable to get to her gun before Jesse, and he takes her as a hostage to counter Chucky, who is holding Jade at gunpoint. They come up to the grave plot of Charles Lee Ray, where the exhumation is currently in progress. When Jesse and Tiffany get there, Chucky has recovered the amulet. The two make an exchange. Jade will go back to Jesse in exchange for Chucky getting Tiffany back, but something is different about her demeanor this time around. She's really had it with Chucky. We see the difference in how Jesse and Chucky treat their women. Jade falls into Jesse's arms, but Chucky lets Tiffany fall to the ground. This allows Tiffany to see how she wants to be treated versus how she's actually treated in real time. And for her, this is the final straw. Jesse and Jade find themselves tied up by Chucky, who attempts to perform the Dembella chant to possess their bodies. But before completing the ritual, Tiffany tells Chucky that she loves him and that they belong together. But while kissing him, she steals his knife and uses it to stab him in the back, before clarifying that they do belong together. They belong together in hell. The two fight, and Chucky stabs her in the chest, but she at least creates enough of a distraction for Jesse to knock Chuck down into the open grave, where he's ultimately killed once more. After the dust settles, the lead detective on the Jesse and Jade case discovered Tiffany's charred remains, and she springs to life with the very last of her energy to give birth to a child before she gives out, in a way fulfilling her mother's prophecy that love would set her free. It's not known exactly how, but Chucky and Tiffany's doll bodies end up in the hands of a movie studio, rather than in another evidence locker. Tiffany's human body is still never discovered. She remains dead for another five years until March 18th, 2004. The dolls have been adapted into animatronics, which are being used to shoot a movie called Chucky Goes Psycho, in which Tiffany helps Chucky defeat a man pretending to be Santa Claus. During a break, they're sitting in a prop room when their child, who has since been given the name Shitface, finally tracks them down and reads the inscription found on the back of the Heart of Dembella, which brings both Chucky and Tiffany to life with a jolt of electricity. Tiffany's motherly instincts immediately kick in, and she asks where his parents are before realizing who he really is. As the two embrace, she calls him Sweetface, the same name that she had given to Jesse when she was hitting on him. Maybe this is not that big of a deal, but I do find it a little bit off-putting that she, time and time again, has shown no separation between romantic love and motherly love. We see it again much later, when she reunites with the doll Chucky, aka her husband, and treats him like a little baby, but we've got a lot to cover before we can even begin to unpack that. And I'm not saying it's weird for couples to use pet names, like a lot of people do that, although it is cringe, but it's more the way that Tiffany does it, in addition to her other pre-existing derangements that makes me feel that this is just another example of Tiffany's poorly adjusted behavior. Before Sweetface can finish filling them in on where they are, the animatronic effects artist comes in to work on Tiffany, but gets a shock upon opening her up to find real human organs. Chucky tosses a length of string around the man's neck, and Tiffany helps do the honors of decapitating him with it. Once again, this act overwhelms the two of them with passion, and all past drama is forgotten as they share a kiss, which is interrupted by the sound of their kid pissing his or her pants. Come to think of it, they never did get around to the whole gender reveal party, considering they were both killed right as he was born. So when they go to check things out for themselves, the kid has no genitals, just as you would expect from a children's doll. Tiffany wants her child to be a girl, while Chucky wants a son. Chucky names the kid Glenn, and Tiffany goes with Glenda. The nomenclature was inspired by the 1953 drama film Glenn or Glenda. I'm just gonna go with Glenn for now to make things easier. The gender disagreement would be the source of a lot of confusion for the child later on, but before arguing any further, they're interrupted by Hollywood actress Jennifer Tilly, who is using this room as a secret snacking location. Tiffany is starstruck upon seeing her idol. Perhaps Miss Tilly was an inspiration to her because she looks and sounds just like Tiffany did when she had a human body. Jennifer Tilly soon realizes that the decapitated head on the ground is no movie prop, and the movie gets shut down to let the crime scene procedures begin. 
The frenzy of paparazzi provides a distraction for Tiffany and her boys to sneak out and stow themselves away in Jennifer Tilly's limo. Tiffany is dazzled by the sight of the Hollywood sunset, and it seems to inspire her to develop a new plan to be a part of that SoCal stardom by transferring her soul into Jennifer Tilly's body and for Chucky to take over the body of rapper slash movie producer Redman so that they can be the most powerful couple in Hollywood or something. However, that leaves Glenn still needing a body, and Tiffany doesn't want to get pregnant again, so she plans to knock out Jennifer before performing the soul transfer ritual, using her as what she calls a surrogate mother and what the rest of us call human trafficking. I think sometimes Tiffany likes to recontextualize the horrible things that she does to distract her from how horrible they are. Like earlier on, when she refers to her killing sprees with Chucky as dates. As they put their child to sleep that evening, he asks a question that they're not prepared for. Why do you kill people? Chucky wants his kid to grow up to become a killer, but Tiffany thinks they should set a good example now that they're parents, and she nags Chucky until he reluctantly agrees to stop killing, mostly to shut her up. Later that night, Tiffany sends Chucky into the bathroom with a cup to start the artificial insemination process, and later knocks out Redman with Mrs. Tilly's Most Improved Actress Award. She confronts and scolds Jennifer on her lack of self-respect for trying to sleep her way into a role, then immediately changes tones and asks her hero for an autograph, which of course freaks Jennifer the f*** out. Maybe that was part of the plan. Jennifer runs for it, so Tiffany once again displays her impressive cannon of an arm and nails her in the back of the head with a trophy. The two dolls drag the unconscious movie stars to bed. Once again, we see the added strength that the magic of Dumbella gives to help them move these bodies, but even still... She's fat. I can't believe it, she's not even pregnant yet. Tiffany is the one to, uh, decorate the cake. The next morning is March 19th, and Tiffany's plan works because Jennifer wakes up thinking her battle with the three-foot plastic superfan was all a dream. Meanwhile, Tiff reads up on kicking her addiction to committing homicide. She kind of skims through the first eight steps, but the ninth tells her to make amends with anyone she might have harmed, so she starts by calling up Ruth Bailey, the widow of the police officer that she killed five years earlier. Her apology confuses and distresses Miss Bailey, but Tiffany seems oblivious, which I see as another coping mechanism to help her ignore how harmful her actions really are. In the evening, Jennifer tells Redman that she's pregnant. Again, the signs show up much faster than usual because the father is being kept alive by voodoo, thus making it a voodoo pregnancy. Redman informs her that he got a vasectomy, so he can't be the father, and adds that she can no longer be in his movie because, in his words, she gots to be hot. Tiffany overhears their conversation through the vent and is outraged, and tempted to kill Redman herself, but she resists the urge and calls up his support hotline instead. The guy that she talks to is very unhelpful though, and almost encourages her by saying that having a slip up is okay because Rome wasn't built in a day. It's unclear if this is a support hotline specifically for serial killers or just a hotline for all types of addicts. At first I thought it was a hotline for all types of addicts, which would explain why he doesn't make a huge deal out of her having a slip up, but again, I'm not sure what he's talking about with this line. I guess he could be talking about a mess he made while he was drunk or something, but it almost sounds like it actually is a serial killer hotline. Regardless, his advice encourages Tiffany to invite herself to dinner with Redman that evening. Glenn notices his mother cutting out Redman's intestines, and Tiffany is embarrassed to have broken her vow in front of him, an event that he doesn't really know how to process. The next morning, March 20th, Chucky and Tiffany watch the execution of Martha Stewart in bed when they hear Jennifer's horrified reaction about her now very visible pregnancy. Jennifer calls her assistant to vent about this scary new development, and Tiffany joins in on the call to confuse and torture them, since her voice is identical to Jennifer's. She finds Chucky tying Jennifer to the bed, and he accidentally drops a photo of him and Glenn killing the paparazzi. This sets her off because of their agreement not to kill anyone to set a good example for their child. A huge argument ensues, and it's not long before they're back on their disagreement of if they should raise a boy or a girl. There's a lot of irony here. After all of her fuss to create a good environment to raise a child by shielding him or her from violence, she ends up putting him or her in the very same environment she likely grew up in, a household with two parents who are constantly fighting. Glenn states he or she cannot decide exactly what he or she wants to be, but knows that he or she is not a killer, and Tiffany says that this makes her proud. Chucky finds Redman's body hidden in the wardrobe, so she's gotta call in a new male body for Chucky to transfer into, which would be Jennifer's limo driver, Stan. Stan, baby, I need your body. I'll be right there. Sim. <laughs> It's not really clear to me why they couldn't just still use Redman, as being alive has never been a prerequisite for possessing a body before. How else would they have gotten into doll bodies in the first place? When Stan arrives, they take him prisoner as well, and Tiffany thinks they're a cute couple, as she did with Jesse and Jade. Her mother's teachings seem to have imparted this idealized version of love that her toxicity prevents her from actually achieving. The vitriol between Chucky and Tiffany continues to build as they prepare for the birth of the baby, and subsequently, the three soul transfer rituals.
With Chucky's call upon the voodoo powers of Dembella looming, an interruption arises in the form of Jennifer Tilly's concerned personal assistant. Chucky finds a hiding spot so that he can surprise and take care of her while Tiffany steps out of the room to grab a drink. When she comes back, she's faced with a very different situation. Glenn has now changed his identity and appearance to Glenda in order to murder Jen's assistant with a makeshift flamethrower. What did I miss? Tiffany is taken aback by this psychotic new behavior, even if she did get what she wanted by Glenn choosing the female identity. She slaps Glenda in the face, telling her to wake up, and this seems to revert her back into being Glenn. Essentially, these are two identities living in one body. If you've seen Psycho, it helped inspire this concept, which I talk more about in the Things You Missed episode on Seed of Chucky. Before they have time to really sort this out, it's time to deliver the baby, and Tiffany serves as the midwife. It's a boy! Yes, we can tell by the blue blanket that you somehow have. However, to Tiffany's surprise, there's also a second twin, and this one's a girl. With three human bodies collected, plus one extra, it's time to perform the voodoo ritual. Tiffany interrupts to allow Glenda the opportunity to choose which twin she wants to inhabit, but realizes, since they have the amulet, this choice doesn't have to be permanent. The cops show up, so she rushes Chucky along to perform the ritual, and with everyone screaming at him, he snaps and backs out of the whole thing. She's unwilling to change her course. She's seen the opportunity for Hollywood stardom, and she chooses that life over an eternity as a doll and breaks up with Chucky. It's over. There's just one problem. You don't break up with the Chuck. He attempts to throw a knife at her, but she's saved by Stan breaking free at just the right time. Or from his point of view, just the wrong time. She throws the blade back at her now ex doll, but with the police just outside and on their way upstairs, all three toys have to duck out. Tiffany and Glenn are able to hitch a ride with the ambulance and sneak into the hospital room where Jennifer Tilly is being tended to. They hide under the bed and listen in on the latest information. The police have somehow cleared her of being the killer, despite being the only witness of the effects guy's death, Red Man's death, her limo driver's death, her assistant's death, and three other people found dead in her home, which makes no sense, but the police aren't convinced that she's mentally competent and might not let her see her newborn children. Tiffany injects something into her IV, which causes her to pass out, and once again tries to proceed with the soul transfer ritual. And switch! And switch! 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 Like her initial spell to try to reawaken Chucky, there's something about how Tiffany performs the ritual that causes the effects to be delayed, and this allows Chucky time to get inside and lodge an axe into her head. With her dying word, she tells Glenn to be a good girl, or boy, and not to make the same mistakes that she and Chucky did. Especially your dad. But these aren't really her last words, obviously. As you can see, there's more time left in the video. The soul transfer takes effect and she rolls over, now in Jennifer's body. Not you. Jennifer Tilly's body. But seeing his mother get chopped up awakens something inside of Glenn and he goes ninja mode. Tiff slides him the axe and he uses it to finish Chucky once and for, well, once. After the deed is done, she tries to console her son, who is surely full of confusing emotions at this point. We can assume they next took the amulet to the nursery to transfer Glenn and Glenda into their human bodies. When the ritual was performed, they really did switch places. At first, it appeared that Jennifer Tilly switched into the doll body, then died immediately. But apparently, she actually survived, and Tiffany held onto the doll to use Jennifer to her advantage. She put her to work, forcing her to do her taxes, play online poker, and even do voiceover work as Bonnie on Family Guy. All of this so Tiffany could live the life of luxury for years to come. Tiffany took over Jennifer Tilly's life, but she was really worried that Jennifer's close relatives would notice something was off about her behavior. So to avoid any suspicion, she cut off contact with them. Tiffany didn't want the twins to feel lonely and without a sense of extended family. So she started organizing regular get-togethers with Jennifer's actor friends. The get-togethers included Bound co-stars Gina Gershon and Joe Pantoliano, as well as Sutton Strack, and they became like the twins' aunts and uncles. Around this time, it was likely that the movie, Seed of Chucky, went into production, as Jennifer Tilly has a Seed of Chucky poster in her home. I'll also note that Jennifer Tilly was credited for being in Bride of Chucky, but I assume that came out before Tiffany took over. The release dates of these movies in the Chucky universe obviously doesn't align with the release dates in our world. All of this happens before the twins' fifth birthday on March 20th, 2009. Tiffany has assumed the life of Jennifer Tilly, so she's holding a big party at her Hollywood Hills mansion. As a single mother, she's hired a new nanny, Fulvia, to help look after the kids, who loves Glenn, but literally fears Glenda. Tiffany uses the doll to beat down Fulvia in an act of revenge for her disloyalty. At the time, it appeared to be just an object, not moving and not alive. It's possible that this was Jennifer, though, holding entirely still. Or maybe she just acquired multiple wedding bell dolls during this time. She once again writes this off as a little slip, so she's continuing to use Rome wasn't built in a day as an excuse to continue her killing career. It seems she has an understanding with Glenda, the murderess of the two kids, to keep all of this quiet, maintaining the illusion of a perfect family for Glenn, which is what he wants more than anything. 
She likely continued living as a Hollywood movie star and poorly parenting her kids through the turn of the decade. At some point, she went back across the country to retrieve her car, which was left outside her old trailer in Lockport, New York. Glenn and Glenda would be eight years old at the beginning of 2013 when Chucky next pops up. We don't know if there was an event that caused Tiff to get back together with him yet again after the dramatic breakup nearly a decade before. All we know is that Chucky somehow shows up at the front door of the woman he was seeing in 1988 right before he got killed, Sarah Pierce. It's possible that somebody helped pack and mail Chucky to Sarah's doorstep, but if that is the case, I don't think it was Tiffany that helped him. Because as I alluded to earlier, I don't think Tiffany ever knew about Sarah, and Chucky wouldn't want to put himself in a situation where Tiffany starts asking questions about who this woman actually is. There's no way she would help him once she found out. Chucky doesn't necessarily need Tiffany's help to package and mail himself. For example, in Child's Play 3, he mails himself to the military academy despite not having connected with her yet. We can only assume he tricks someone else into helping him, or he somehow does it himself. It's not really explained. Anyways, after arriving in Rhode Island, Chucky massacres the Pierce family, and the only survivors are Sarah's daughter, Nika Pierce, and granddaughter, Alice Pierce. There's a very public trial in April 2013, where the Chucky doll is used as a key piece of evidence, and Nika is blamed for the murders and ruled to be insane. Tiffany probably heard about this in the news and realized that Chucky was back and started to fall for him again because she can't resist a killer. It's an inescapable cycle for her. On April 6th or 7th, the day that Nika's trial ended, she pulls out an old trick by bribing a police officer to bring her the evidence, aka the Chucky doll, before grabbing him from behind and slashing his throat. The same thing she did to Robert Bailey 14 years before. Presumably, Chucky and Tiffany rekindle their relationship and Tiffany agrees to help him with his plan by mailing him to his next destination, where Chucky tricks Alice into letting him perform the chant and take over her body. After doing so, Tiffany goes through the adoption process to become Alice's legal guardian, using the name Tiffany Valentine. Important note, she did not sign the adoption paperwork as the movie star Jennifer Tilly. Did anyone ever tell you you look exactly like Jennifer Tilly? Yeah, I get that a lot. Remember when I said that Chucky and Tiffany hiding Tiffany's original human body would be important later? This is why. Tiffany is an expert at disposing of human remains, so nobody ever finds her original corpse. This allows her to be Jennifer in her day-to-day -day life, but also Tiffany whenever it's convenient for her. If Jennifer had tried to adopt Alice, there would have been a huge spotlight on her, and if something were to happen to Alice, it wouldn't look good, considering that Miss Tilly was the sole witness of six murders that took place in her house in 2004. But since Tiffany is the one adopting the child, people aren't really going to be paying attention. This also goes back to what I said earlier about Tiffany not distinguishing romantic love from motherly love. From the outside, it's a random woman taking in an orphaned little girl, but from her point of view, she's adopting her lover, which is weird. After Alice's usefulness eventually runs its course, she is allegedly killed, something that Tiffany later expresses regret for. Even here, she can't fully suppress her motherly instincts. I'm assuming Tiffany was also the person to mail one duplicate Chucky to Andy Barkley's apartment six months later on November 8th, 2013, though it didn't end well for him. Andy. This doesn't really matter though, because by this time, Chucky has discovered a new spell on VoodooForDummies.com that allows him to split his soul into multiple different bodies. Tiffany would also find uses for this spell, and Chucky and Tiffany's relationship would get a whole lot more interesting. By the year 2017, Tiffany and Chucky are somehow still on good terms. Or at least they're back on good terms. Who knows how many times they broke up from 2013 to 2017. Chucky's new plan is to create an entire army of Chucky dolls using the VoodooForDummies.com spell. It seems that there's a limit to how many times he can replicate his soul individually, but if he can get an innocent to kill for him, he can automatically possess a massive number of dolls. Tiffany is in on this plan. She does her part by visiting the psychiatric hospital where Nika Pierce is being held in captivity on January 23rd. When Nika enters the room, Tiffany can be seen sharpening her deadly nail file, and she's all dressed up in red, her favorite color. Guess goth was just a phase. In this scene, she's playing the role of Alice's mother, Tiffany Valentine. As far as the public record is concerned, this woman has never been married, so she doesn't go by Tiffany Ray when using this identity. From the get-go, the two don't get along, and Tiffany casually drops that Alice is dead, which devastates Nika. She fakes a few tears of her own and says that she suspects Alice's death was due to a broken heart. Essentially, she wants Nika to feel like she's responsible. But messing with Nika was just a bonus. The real purpose of the trip was to smuggle a new Chucky doll into the mental hospital. That's not the same. No, no. This is the doll that they used in Alice's therapy to help her get over the past. She thought that maybe it would help you too. With her mission accomplished, she leaves. Two days later, on January 25th, she gives Andy Barkley a call and introduces herself as... Tiffany. Jennifer. Even I lose track. 
which means she has probably been freely switching between the two quite a lot. I guess nobody noticed that Tiffany got her tattoo removed. Andy says he knows who she is and he's coming for her and Chucky, which she responds to by informing him that there are three of them at the moment, Chucky, Tiffany, and a second Chucky. She invites Andy to join the cult, which he refuses, so she delivers a message from Chucky. It's just a single word, disembowel. Chucky continues to carry out his plan by inhabiting multiple dolls inside Harrogate Hospital. The only other thing Tiffany does during this time is split her own soul into another body. Remember how I said she got a second wedding bell doll? It's a good insurance policy to have a backup in case either of them gets killed. When the time comes to get out of Harrogate, Tiffany essentially plays the role of getaway driver, which may have brought them closer together because she was there for him where his older driver, Eddie Caputo, was not. I mean, he wouldn't have been on the run in 1988 in the first place if it wasn't for Tiffany, but it's a nice gesture nonetheless. Okay, not really, they're both f***ing cancer. Chucky walks out after possessing the body of Nika, and Tiffany is just happy to have her man back in a human body. It didn't matter that it was a woman's body this time. We saw very early on in her history that she's a bisexual. Like that first encounter, they make out next to the dead body. In this case, the Harrogate Hospital security guard. I hope they didn't do this kind of stuff when Chucky possessed Alice. If you're like me, you've probably wondered at some point during this story about how law enforcement can be so totally incompetent. Charles Lee Ray was a well-known serial killer in the 80s. Tiffany had many of her own run-ins with the law during that time. Surely, someone saw them together. Surely, someone noticed that her disappearance in 1999 coincided with the appearance of Charles Lee Ray's fingerprints on many new crime scenes. Surely eyebrows were raised when Tiffany Valentine reappeared out of nowhere to adopt the last remaining family member of Charles Lee Ray's late mistress. Well, it seems that at some point between 2017 and 2021, investigators finally connected those dots, and Tiffany Valentine is identified as a known accomplice to Charles Lee Ray. This information goes public on the internet. She's no longer able to use that identity, so she continues going by Jennifer Tilly in public and Tiffany Ray around Chucky. My theory is that Andy was the one to point police to the fact that Charles and Tiffany are affiliated because when she talks to him on the phone in cult, he tells her, I know who you are. In March 2021, Glenn and Glenda turn 17, so Tiffany can go away on trips more often and not have to worry about them as much. At some point, she takes Chucky back to Hackensack to revisit the early parts of their relationship. Since there are multiple Chuckies now, I'll refer to this version as Nika Chucky. Nika occasionally takes the driver's seat, which Tiffany kind of likes, but pretends not to notice for now. Sometimes when we're together, I, I see you looking at me. And I know it's you. It's not Chucky. It's you and I live for those moments. If you thought it was not possible for Chucky and Tiffany's relationship to get any more weird and toxic, think again. Despite this, she continues helping Chucky with his master plan to terrorize America with an army of Chucky dolls. To do this, she meets with Hackensack's mayor, Michelle Cross, to propose a benefit screening and auction. The proceeds of the screening are supposed to fund Better Days Children's Hospitals, with the dolls being sent to sick kids across the US. Each one is a vintage good guy doll from Jennifer's personal collection. If the plan works as they hope, each of these 72 dolls will be possessed with Charles Lee Ray's soul. Although her feelings for Chucky are mixed, Tiffany could never pass up an opportunity like this to spread mayhem. And from Mayor Cross's point of view, it's a good PR stunt to promote her re-election, a distraction from the fact that the death toll in her city has been on the rise. The charity event is scheduled for mid-November. On November 8th, 2021, Chucky and Tiffany are back in the hotel room where they first made love, this time with a new prisoner and the old arguments start up again, this time about Jennifer's weight, which has basically been on a steady incline. The next day, she cuts their guest up into smaller pieces and tries to pack him into a suitcase, and her inability to do so, combined with Chucky's unwillingness to help, causing her to storm off yet again. It's basically the same fight about the dishes still going on two decades later. In mid-November, Tiff puts her Monsters Inc. residuals to good use and buys Charles Lee Ray's childhood home in Hackensack to use as a base of operations for their ever-expanding cult. Before the deal closes, she sits around with Chucky in their hotel playing poker, a reference to the real-life Jennifer Tilly's side career as a professional poker player. When she notices that Nika has covertly taken the driver's seat, it's probably her poker skills that allow her to easily detect when control switches from Chucky to Nika. In a 2007 appearance on The Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson, she discusses how she worked with a celebrity profiler to learn how to read her opponent's body language, so she probably picked up on the subtle differences in behavior between Chucky and Nika. Nika is disabled from the waist down, but only when she has the wheel. When Chucky's in control, he can use Nika's legs freely. To test her theory, Tiffany sticks a knife into Nika's leg and, as expected, gets no reaction. Before revealing that she knows it's Nika, she plays along and tests her a bit, learning that Nika drinks less beer, bites her nails, and takes bigger risks, at least in poker. She's able to trick Nika into revealing her true self because Tiffany has a great poker face. She's not only bluffing in the card game, but also in their conversation. Jennifer Tilly won her first professional poker tournament in 2005, which works well with her timeline. 
In the Chucky universe, this is one year after Tiffany possessed her body, so we can assume it was actually Tiffany who made her great at poker. Eventually, Tiffany reveals that she knows it's Nika and gets choked up as she explains that she actually prefers being with Nika. I live for those moments. She claims that she actually bought the Sherwood Lane house to share with Nika, not Chucky, but honestly, I don't even know if she's telling the truth about that because she's kind of unraveling at this point, or at least unraveling more than usual. She says that she wants to find a way to keep Nika in the driver's seat instead of that rat Chucky, but then proceeds to randomly knock Nika out with a frying pan. I think she's conflicted about what she wants. I know this is a character analysis video, but she's become so unhinged from the constant opening and closing the door on her relationship with Chucky that it almost doesn't make sense to try to make sense of her character at this stage. If I had to take a stab at it though, no pun intended, it seems like she wants to help raise Chucky's army because she likes spreading terror, but she's leaning towards Nika from a relationship standpoint. After picking up the keys to her new house, she ties Nika up in the chair in the living room and leaves her with a kiss before heading out. We don't know exactly where she goes, but my assumption is that she's meeting with Mayor Cross to make sure they're still on for the benefit screening, which would serve as a positive distraction from the recent set of murders that have plagued the town over the last month or so, which of course were caused by Chucky, who is still trying to convince an innocent soul to kill as part of his ritual. Tiffany's next move is to help Chucky move this along, this time not with her poker skills, but her acting skills. Chucky's new main target is middle school student Jake Wheeler, who purchased another incarnation of the doll at a yard sale in October. I like to refer to this one as Cope Chucky, the same Chucky that Alice supposedly used to cope with the massacre of her family. In an attempt to make Jake more emotionally distraught, Cope Chucky kills Jake's father, then kills the aunt that took him in, Bree Wheeler. However, Jake still refuses to kill, but Chucky realizes that there may be another child who will, Jake's cousin, Junior. Tiffany plays a part in driving Junior to the brink of homicide. One day, not long after buying the house, Tiffany shows up at Bree's wake. She makes a big entrance, walks up smiling to the grieving widower, and plants a kiss on his lips. Although her motive isn't clear at the moment, this is part of a larger effort to piss off Junior and turn him against his dad by making him think that his mother killed herself because Logan was having an affair. She continues to push this idea when she brings over a meal for the mourning family and Junior comes to the door to receive it. She tells him that it's important to have a woman in the house and plants the idea of herself as the mother figure in Junior's life, which fires him up because he only just lost his mom. Tiffany pretends like she's slipped up and said too much before leaving. This, in combination with Chucky hammering it home later, Cancer wasn't enough, huh? You had to cheat on her too. Real classy, dad. Finally pushes Junior to kill his dad and completes Chucky's voodoo ritual. This all ties into the part that Jennifer Tilly is supposed to play at the benefit screening. That evening, Tiffany comes home and discovers Nika Chucky has gotten out of the chair and finds her laying on the ground. She assumes that Nika's in control, unable to get up due to her paralyzed legs, but this assumption ends up being incorrect when she receives a powerful kick, knocking her to the ground. This is Chucky, and he straddles her with a knife and threatens to kill her for the fourth time. Tiffany begs that he can't kill her because he still needs her, and she's absolutely correct. Think about it. Well, thinking is for losers. Think again. She's right, bro. We need her. It's interesting how she's developed this animosity towards the Charles Lee Ray living in Nika's body, but when she sees one inside of a doll body, she lights up and refers to him as Sweet Face. They're the same person, it's just that she's been spending a lot more time with the one in Nika's body, so their toxic relationship has turned them against each other. Fuck you, Chucky. Thank you, Chucky. This is also the example I brought up earlier in this lesson. Chucky is a romantic partner to her, but she treats him like a baby. Come to mama. Good, good guy. It's just weird, man. She takes Cope Chucky downstairs to where the army has awakened. She also finds Jake's friend Devin, who is tied up, and Junior, who has joined the side of the bad guys. After Chucky gives a speech to his troops, Tiffany sees to it that the army of Chucky's is packed into the transport truck and stows away the doll version of herself to facilitate things, in case the plan gets off track. She plans to meet the driver the following day at the theater. Back in the basement, it's basically a party for the bad guy. She tries to talk to Cope Chucky, who brushes her off as he's busy catching up with Nika Chucky. She gets especially butt hurt when Nika Chucky brags about being able to pick up women, even in a woman's body. Tiffany mentions that girl on girl isn't the only thing that Nika Chucky is getting. She's talking about peeing. This causes Tiffany to blow up on Nika Chucky and slap him, which seems to knock Chucky out of the driver's seat and give control back to Nika. At least she treats me with a little respect. Cope Chucky senses what's going on between Nika and Tiffany and offers an apology for his self-righteous attitude, but it comes with a caveat. Killer. You know what that does to me. This leaves Tiffany flustered. She argues that Nika holds a part of Chucky's soul as well, but he doesn't care since there are 72 other Chuckies on the truck. She reluctantly agrees in tears. Who is it you're afraid of losing, Tiff? 
Me or her? When Tiffany doesn't act, he orders Junior to do it. But before he can muster the courage, Tiff retaliates by attacking the doll and cutting his head off which she picks up and delivers another dramatic breakup speech to. Chucky threatens to kill her with one of his many incarnations, but she boasts that he needs her too much. She brings out a suitcase, which she explains to be a present from Glenda, the violent one of her two twins. The luggage is filled with bombs, which she sets as a trap for Andy Barkley when he inevitably arrives. Tiffany, Junior, and one of the 72 dolls that Junior stole are loaded up into the car and don't emerge again until the next day when the mayor introduces Jennifer Tilly at the benefit screening and auction. During the announcement, the mayor's youngest daughter, Caroline, throws a fit because she wants a Chucky doll, so Tiffany gives her one extra. I'm sure one measly little sick child can take care of himself. Here, sweetheart. Your very own good guy doll. She doesn't seem to stay for the screening, which is odd because it's a prequel to the movie that she was so moved by, Bride of Frankenstein. I'm guessing she's got other things to do, like meeting up with the driver and briefing him on when the plane leaves and how she's gonna kill him if he's late. With that, she gets into her car and turns around to see that Andy has hijacked the truck. Not all is lost though. She must have forgotten about her backup plan, or maybe the tantrum was just part of a performance to get Andy to let his guard down before this happens. The doll version of Tiffany breaks the window and introduces herself to Andy by holding him at gunpoint and ordering him to drive to the airport if he knows what's good for him. Meanwhile, the human version of Tiffany goes back to her favorite room at the Hotel Hackensack with Nika, who is incapacitated. It's not clear how she snuck Nika's unconscious body upstairs without drawing suspicion, but given that she's a disposal expert, it's not hard to imagine that she'd also be good at smuggling live bodies. She also had less weight to carry because as a preventative measure, she decided to cut off all of Nika's limbs. This way, Chucky can't go anywhere no matter what, can't kick her and can't kill her as he promised back at the basement. As Tiffany holds Andy at gunpoint, three good guy dolls from Chucky's army escape from their boxes and have their own conversation in the back. It seems that they don't recognize Andy and Tiffany right away, which Andy points out. They don't know me. They don't know you either. They don't know what she did. This distracts Tiffany, so Andy is able to swerve, making her drop her gun. He picks it up and blows her head off, and that is the end of the doll Tiffany that was introduced in Colt. That just leaves Tiffany living in Jennifer Tilly's body. She isolates herself and Nika in the Beverly Hills house and decorates Nika's room to look like a doll's room. Tiffany's obsession with dolls is projected on Nika and she treats her like a doll, dressing her up, feeding her, and mothering her, despite Nika's discomfort with this. In addition to all of Tiffany's other problems, she becomes essentially agoraphobic. According to the Mayo Clinic, agoraphobia involves fearing and avoiding places or situations that might cause panic and feelings of being trapped, helpless, or embarrassed. It's often described as the fear of going outside, which may be a result of the authorities closing in on Nika's location. She uses a security system app, allowing her to monitor all points of entry into the property so she can always know who's coming and who's going. Tiffany spends most of her time making Nika watch Jennifer Tilly movies with her, like when they watch Liar Liar. She repeats all of Jennifer's lines as if it was her who played that part. She's reveling in the past, just like the character Norma Desmond from Sunset Boulevard, only she's obsessed with Jennifer's past, not her own. Nika criticizes her for living this way and points out that this lifestyle is not sustainable in the long run, claiming, I know you went through all of Jennifer Tilly Simpson's money. How does someone go through a hundred million dollars. Tiffany brushes this off, saying, It's not easy being me. It's not cheap being me either. However, her sense of safety is shattered in November of 2022 when Tiffany wakes up to find the doll version of her head under the covers with her. After feeding Nika breakfast, she pulls out her nail file and cuts her own hand open, and the sight of blood forces Nika to relinquish control to Chucky. Tiffany freaks out and assumes Chucky is responsible, to which Chucky responds that he's coming for her. We still don't really know how the doll head got there, considering Nika Chucky has no way of communicating communicating with the others, and the multiple Chuckies are not a hive mind situation. Perhaps if a new Chucky is created, he would begin with all of the information of the past Chuckies and thus know Nika Chucky's location. However, we don't know of any new Chuckies being created between the movie theater incident and the doll head wake up call. Tiffany prepares for Glenn and Glenda's birthday weekend. The twins were born in March, not November, but they were busy, they were in school. Look, the birthday is just in November now, okay? To keep Nika quiet during the festivities, Tiffany asks if she'd prefer the ball gag or chloroform, but their conversation is interrupted. Once again, her security system is a breach as a detective rings the doorbell. Tiffany meets Detective Gavin, who is investigating the missing persons case of Nika Pierce. Caught off guard, Tiffany tells him that she knows nothing and shuts the door on him, hoping that he'll go away. Which he does, but only temporarily 
temporarily. The next day, Tiffany is preparing the birthday cakes when she hears the gate chime, assumes that it's the twins, and allows access to the house. But when she gets to the door, it's Detective Gavin again, insisting that he thinks Jennifer Tilly is likely hiding Nika Pierce. In a panic, Tiffany slits his throat, and with no time to properly dispose of him, she jams his body into a coat closet and tries to mop up the blood with one of her sweaters, just as Glenn and Glenda walk in. After so many years and so much plotting, she finds herself back in the familiar position of trying to hide her violent true nature from her kids. They both seem shocked and surprised to see blood, suggesting that maybe Glenda was too young to remember witnessing Tiffany kill the nanny on her fifth birthday. Tiffany plays off the blood as just corn syrup, explaining that the violent content is what her fans want. This is enough to pacify Glenn and Glenda. As a reminder, they think that their mom is the actress, Jennifer Tilly, and they don't really know who Tiffany Valentine is. As they talk, the twins reveal that they know that their mom is having money trouble, which makes her defensive. As she tries to change the subject, Glenn asks who Nika Pierce is, again catching her by surprise as the twins are not supposed to know anything about Nika. Tiffany wavers back and forth between claiming that Nika is someone that she barely knows to saying that she's an obsessed stalker, which is why she needs all of the security. In the midst of this, Glenn gets up to look for a cell phone charger and Glenda uses the opportunity to ask if there's anything that she's hidden from them because both of them keep having the same nightmare. Glenda describes this nightmare, which involved lighting a woman on fire and a man addressing someone named Shitface. Tiffany, realizing that Glenda somehow remembers killing Jennifer's assistant in 2004, panics and blames it on Glenn and Glenda's very active imagination. To prevent them from finding the room that Nika's in, she hires a butler and even gives him a fancy name, Jeeves. Very original. We have no idea where Tiffany found this guy or what his deal is, but she puts him in charge of guarding the door to Nika's room. While she's leading him to his post, she's startled to find Glenn trying to get into that same room. Tiffany quickly shuts this down and tries to play it off as if it's no big deal, claiming that all of her shoes are in there. As Tiffany walks back to the living room, she's met with another surprise, literally. Surprise! Apparently, Glenn and Glenda arranged their own surprise party with Gina Gershon, Sutton Strack, and Joe Pantoliano. The whole situation turns into a huge intervention of her friends wanting to know why Jennifer disappeared on them for the past year. But things get worse for Tiffany when Jennifer's sister, Meg Tilly, arrives. While everyone else has been ghosted for only one year, Meg had been ghosted for 20. Tiffany does her best to brush the whole thing off, but Meg isn't having it and pleads for answers. As Tiffany does a wardrobe change to look more appropriate for the party, she puts on the dress Jennifer Tilly wore to the Academy Awards. Little does Tiffany know, the whole party was all a distraction so that Glenn and Glenda could help Nika escape. Glenda slips some arsenic into Jeeves' drink, killing him and leaving the door to Nika's room unguarded. When Tiffany and the dinner guests discover Jeeves' body and the now empty bedroom, Tiff acts fast and convinces everyone that this is a murder mystery dinner party and that Jeeves is just acting. This works to her advantage because she too needs to find out who killed Jeeves so that she can use that person to find the missing Nika. As everyone investigates, Tiffany has two separate bedroom encounters, one with Gina Gershon and the other with Joe Pantoliano, both of which serve to further distract her from Nika's escape until Chucky regains control of Nika's body and sneaks up on her as she's interrogating Meg, pulling a gun into her face. I'm almost gonna miss you, Tiff. No, no, no. almost. I think it's fair to say by this point, Chucky and Tiffany went from being a toxic couple to being toxic exes. The initial attraction that kept drawing them back to each other does seem to genuinely be gone, and now they're just trying to kill each other. However, to Chucky's surprise, the gun is empty, giving Tiffany the chance to slap Nika in the face, which, just like when Glenn slash Glenda was a doll, forces Nika to switch back to her true self. As Nika awakens, she realizes this is her last chance for escape and truly books it out of there, using the prosthetic arms. Glenn and Glenda argue about leaving with Nika. Glenn is appalled that Glenn Glenda almost allowed their mom to be killed and opts to stay with Tiffany while Glenda takes off with Nika to try to get to the bottom of what's really going on. Tiffany throws an absolute tantrum at the thought of losing her beloved Nika and tries to close the gate before she can get away, but Nika and Glenda make it through just in time and are taken away by a very ADA compliant van that's waiting on the street. Tiffany is left behind in a mess and on top of everything that just transpired, Glenn asks who Tiffany Valentine is, but their conversation gets interrupted. Gina and Sutton go home, thinking that they just attended a really believable murder mystery party, but Meg isn't ready to give up and stays overnight, confronting Tiffany the next morning and demanding a connection with her sister. When Tiffany asks Meg when she plans on leaving, she says she won't leave until she gets some answers. Seeing that she's backed into a trap, Tiffany gets desperate. She leaves the room and goes into what looks like a storage room in her house. She's got a lot of secret rooms in this house. She pulls the cover off of a cage where the real Jennifer Tilly, who is living in Tiffany's old doll form, is being held captive. It probably would have made sense for her to just hide Nika in here during the party. You know, keep your prisoners all in one place. Tiffany ignores her pleas for chocolate and tells her that her sister is upstairs and she needs to know who the Dean 
brothers are. Jennifer realizes this could be her last chance to see her sister or possibly escape, so instead of telling about the Dean brothers, she explains the plot of the movie The Blues Brothers. When Tiffany recounts this to Meg, she realizes this and becomes even more suspicious. Feeling embarrassed, she storms back into the storage room, but this time she's followed by Meg and Glenn, who discover who this little prisoner is. Tiffany pulls out her classic nail file and gives everyone manicures. No. No, that's not what happens. She brutally kills Meg in front of her long-lost sister. That's one way to put a damper on the family reunion. Glenn, who has always been sheltered from Tiffany's evil side, watches in horror. Who are you? My name is Tiffany Valentine, and I'm your goddamn mother! As Tiffany sits down and explains everything to Glenn, she says that she has one last birthday present, the original Glenn slash Glenda doll. They both vow that they need to go find Glenda. Tiffany was once heralded as the body disposal expert, but I guess she figured that hiding the body sitting in her house wouldn't do much good because police would probably know that Detective Gavin's last whereabouts were at her mansion. Jennifer Tilly was about to become a fugitive no matter what. That being said, I still don't get why she sets the house on fire. It seems extremely unnecessary, but then again, she's not exactly a stable person. She drives off in her red Pontiac with Jennifer and Glenn. It doesn't take long for word to hit the news that the famous actress is a murderer, but that doesn't stop her from being swarmed by fans at a roadside diner. I can't tell if this is a dumb scene or some kind of scathing commentary on how people idolize celebrities too much. I don't know why she didn't just switch back into the doll body at this point. The only thing I can figure is that she kind of knows that once she returns to being a doll, Jennifer Tilly is going to be arrested, so she's savoring her final moments in a human body that resembles her own. She does plan to trade places with Jennifer again, but Jennifer no longer wants her own body now that she's wanted for murder. So she escapes the car and makes a run for it, but her escape is cut short when she's destroyed by a semi-truck, leaving Tiffany without a plan B. But first things first, Tiffany and Glenn's priority is getting back to Glenda, so they continue the cross-country road trip back to where it all began, New Jersey. Tiffany and Glenn show up at the Catholic School of the Incarnate Lord later that week and discover all that has happened. Chucky was separated from Nika's body and Glenda informs Glenn that their father is dead. However, as we all know, Chucky always comes back, but we'll get to that later. Tiffany, somehow more of an emotional wreck than usual, tries to talk to Nika, but Nika pulls a gun on her, hungry for revenge for everything that Tiff has put her through. Glenn, being the more sheltered, non-violent twin, dives in front of Tiffany to save her and takes the bullet. Tiffany and Glenda rush her to the hospital, but due to Jennifer Tilly being wanted for murder, only Glenda can go inside. Glenn goes into a coma and is not expected to live much longer. So on December 22nd, 2022, Tiffany devises a plan to sneak in and transfer the twins back into the doll. I don't really understand why Glenda can't just do it. I mean, Tiffany is just going off the Voodoo for Dummies book anyway, but I'm not an expert on Voodoo. There's probably a very good reason that this particular soul transfer has to be performed by a third party. The plan is nearly foiled when a police officer discovers them, but a quick-thinking Tiffany smashes him over the head with a vase. Shortly after, Glenda's murderous side comes comes out. This allows Tiffany to execute the voodoo ritual and leave with Glenn slash Glenda packed safely in a suitcase, while the twins' abandoned human bodies lay in the hospital bed for this unfortunate nurse to find. Fun fact, these are not dead bodies, they're just abandoned vessels. Which means I can show them. I've been waiting my whole career for something like this to happen. Tiffany gives Glenn slash Glenda a makeover and asks what she should call the unified child now. Everyone agrees that the name GG would be appropriate. You got one G for Glenn, you got the other G for Glenda. It's perfect. Also, GG's English accent comes back for some reason, in addition to the sudden desire to go to England. Tiffany supports this and offers a ride to the post office, using the same method of travel that she's used for Chucky many times in the past. That just leaves the question of where she'll be depositing her own soul, and the answer comes when she sees Hackensack's former mayor live streaming her Christmas decorating. We will just assume this is a burner phone because police haven't figured out her location yet. Mrs. Cross has a wedding bell doll, which is exactly the type of doll that Tiffany needs to return to doll form. Realizing this is her one chance, she goes to Michelle Cross's house on Christmas Eve, but to her surprise, the doll is missing from the nativity scene in the front yard when she arrives. She sneaks into the house and is immediately discovered by Mrs. Cross, who, instead of being alarmed by wanted killer Jennifer Tilly being in her home, is starstruck and tries to use her for social media clout. This is cut short though, when Chucky, I told you he'd be back, lunges out with a chainsaw and slices Michelle in half. He's about to go for Tiffany when Michelle's oldest daughter, Lexi, drops down from the stairs and pins him to the ground while she revs up his chainsaw. Chucky pleads with Tiffany to help him, but she demonstrates that she's truly done with him and walks away to go find the bell doll. She finds it in the younger sister Caroline's room, but quickly finds herself cornered by Jake, Devin, and Lexi. 
However, just as the teenagers seem to have her completely trapped, Caroline walks out and hands Tiffany a knife before basically giving herself up as a hostage and explaining that she's been loyal to Chucky the whole time. She's been brainwashed into believing that her real family is not actually her real family and that Tiffany is actually her mom. Caroline has been waiting for the day that Tiffany would come for her. Tiffany, who loves an excuse to mother anything, leaves with Caroline and flees to New York City, where she changes her look to this Uma Thurman kind of haircut and survives incognito for a few weeks. She seems to think she's in the clear until late January 2023, when she gets a call from Nika. Nika first apologizes for nearly killing Glenn, but then makes it clear that she's still close with Gigi. Tiffany reacts to this in a way that makes it seem likely that Nika probably talks to Gigi more than she does. But before she can get too upset, Nika lets her know that she knows where she is and she's going to kill her, but allows her to get a head start. So Tiffany tries to do the Dembella ritual, but like always, it doesn't initially work. Possess! 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 Possess, you stupid doll! The doll does sit up, but things don't go how Tiffany had planned. This is no Bell doll at all, but rather Chucky in disguise. It becomes clear to Tiffany that Chucky and Caroline have set her up. Chucky lunges at her with his knife while Tiffany screams helplessly on the floor. That's the last we see of Tiffany Valentine, for now. At the end of the season, it seems like Tiffany may have finally met her demise at the hands of Chucky. This is something that he's been attempting to do for a few years now, and it looks like he may have finally succeeded. However, there's also the possibility that Tiffany's Dembella ritual may have delayed effects as it has in the past, and she could be transferred into Chucky at the last minute. This could force the two to share a body and create some really interesting dynamics in the future. We'll have to keep watching to find out. So if you want my updated analysis of Tiffany as new seasons or movies are released, and you want to see my character analysis timelines of other Chucky franchise characters, make sure you subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring the death bell, and select all notifications, and I will see you in the next one. Assuming we both survive.